but they won't be safe forever. Beside the Capitol's dome, the flag flew at half-staff. Senate Joint Resolution 22, expressing the sense of the Senate and the House of Representatives regarding the terrorist attacks launched against the United States on September 11, 2001. At 10 a.m., the House and Senate convened simultaneously. The only business, a three-page joint resolution condemning yesterday's attacks and declaring today a national day of unity and mourning. Now, Mr. President, it's so important that we show that even these terrible acts cannot stop America from going, from going forward. We must get on with our important work. Today we go back to work in Washington, New York, and all around the country, and we're determined to show the world that America will not be defeated by anyone. A short time later, Congress's leaders met privately with the president. They emerged promising Mr. Bush will get whatever he needs to respond to yesterday's events. We're in uh, complete agreement uh, that we will work together that uh, we want to share information, that we will be ready to uh, move on whatever the president uh, uh, suggests, and uh, we will go through the, the debate and the actions of Congress in a bipartisan way to make that happen. We will work with the administration to allocate the resources and to dedicate whatever strategy may be required to fulfill our obligations. It is our strong desire to do this not as Republicans or Democrats, but as Americans. And we will continue to demonstrate that desire as we consider whatever other actions may be required in days ahead. Congress could approve billions in emergency funds to aid New York City and install new security measures as early as the end of the week. It was late this afternoon that Attorney General John Ashcroft and FBI Director Robert Mueller revealed a wider terrorist threat yesterday and substantial progress in the investigation. The four planes were hijacked by between three and six individuals per plane using knives and box cutters and in some cases making bomb threats. Our government has credible evidence that the White House and Air Force One were targets. A number of the suspected hijackers were trained as pilots in the United States. We have, in the last 24 hours, taken the manifests and used those as an, evident, as an evidentiary base and have talked to many of the families of the victims and have successfully, I believe, identified many of the hijackers on each of the four flights that went down. We also have identified through a number of leads, principally at the cities of origin, a number of individuals whom we believe may have had something to do with the hijackings, and we are pursuing those leads aggressively. At his daily briefing, White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer was quizzed about why Air Force One flew from Florida to Louisiana and Nebraska yesterday before finally returning to Andrews Air Force Base near Washington. Because the information that we had was real incredible uh, about Air Force One, uh, the manner in which Air Force One operated maintained the security of Air Force One at all times. and. Uh, that also is one of the reasons why Air Force One did not come back to Andrews, where some people may have thought it would. A short time ago, the president made the short trip from the White House to the Pentagon, where he praised rescue workers. More on the investigation now, and to Margaret Warner. And joining us is Evan Thomas, assistant managing editor of Newsweek magazine. Evan, flesh out a little more for us what uh, Ashcroft and Mueller just said. First of all, about what they've learned about what happened yesterday. Well, the FBI believes that there was an act of uh, heroism on, on the plane that didn't get to Washington, the plane that crashed near Pittsburgh. I actually spoke uh, last night, as, as the FBI has, I think, several times, to a woman named Liz Glick, whose husband, Jeremy, was on that plane. And he called on a cell phone and told her the plane had been hijacked. And he said that he was talking to some other male passengers, four or five other passengers, about taking a last-ditch attempt to jump the hijackers, as he put it. Uh, 
the, they could hear over the phone then screams, silence, screams again, silence, and then nothing. And the FBI believes there was some kind of a wrestling match and that that plane uh, crashed in a field instead of getting to Washington and hitting the White House or the Capitol or some, some real target. And then how, does the, how do investigators know, and maybe they're not saying, but that Air Force One and the White House were targets? Well, I don't know how they know about Air Force One. I mean, the White House was definitely, uh, the plane that crashed into the Pentagon was actually headed right for the White House. So just and by looking at the flight. Looking at the flight plan turned into, turned into the Pentagon. Uh, I'm not sure about the other one, uh, why, they think the, why they think the Air Force One was a target. Now, then we heard Ashcroft or Mueller say that they have identified from the flight manifest, they think a lot of the hijack a great many of the hijackers, who are they? Well, uh, the FBI has a lot of these guys in their filing cabinets. I mean, they've, 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 some of these names that have turned up in connection with this investigation are familiar names. This, of course, raises the question of, you know, was there an intelligence failure? If they knew who these people were, why couldn't they catch them? I think the answer to that is it's easier said than done. I mean, they were tapping the phones of the people who bombed the embassies in Africa for about a year, and they still miss that. So uh, there'll be lots of investigations and recriminations. But the point is that the, I think they're going to crack this cell. They're, they're going to find out who did this. But do, for instance, do they know the um, nationality of these people? Yeah, they, they, they're, they're foreigners. They're Middle Easterners who were, as has been described to, to us at Newsweek, who were in this country from between a week and a year. Uh, uh, that's, that's the time frame. Came from many different countries. All of this suggests a very careful, deliberate, orchestrated uh, act. Now, another focus, as they said today, is people who are still around, not hijackers, who helped them. And there was a whole flurry today about arrests or detentions, different yeah. words were used in both Boston and in Florida. What can you tell us about that? Well, they're just trying to hold these people until they find out. I mean, when they, when they talk about uh, holding somebody as a material witness, they may become suspects. They just don't have enough evidence yet. Or they may truly be witnesses. They may be family members. They want to hold on to these people, uh, pull the string back, as it were. Uh, but they are well on their way. Uh, to finding out who did this. What has been the most helpful pieces of evidence, for instance, in identifying some of these accom alleged accomplices or material witnesses? Well, you know about this rental car they found in Boston that had uh, Arab materials. Uh, uh, linked to one of the hijackers. Linked to one of the hijackers. Uh, they're looking at these flight schools, these pilot training schools in Florida. One of the pilots who trained at these schools is missing, and they think that he was one of the pilots who flew one of those uh, Boeing airliners into the ground. And then, of course, all the cell phone calls from passengers who were right. on the plane. Uh, there are descriptions of the, of the hijackers from those, from those cell phones, although I'm not sure that's as important as, as things like just the ticket, who bought the ticket yeah. and, and tracing canceled checks, uh, credit cards, that kind of thing. And then uh, how far have they gotten in establishing who their outside sponsors might have been? The, of course, there's been all this talk about Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden. I mean, they, you, you still hear from investigators this figure, 90 percent sure it was bin Laden, only bin Laden could have pulled this off. I mean, a combination of circumstantial evidence and intercepts uh, of calls to bin Laden saying that we hit the target, uh, which sounds pretty convincing. Now, maybe those are false claims or maybe there's some story we don't know, but but, but they, they think they have electronic intercepts that tie uh, bin Laden directly. And finally, how far along are they in collecting physical evidence actually at the crash scenes? For instance, the black boxes. We haven't heard about uh, recovering uh, I those. I think that's all. I mean, uh, uh, I know they're worried that they're never going to get them out of the World Trade Center and all of that rubble. I think they're more optimistic that they're going to find them at the Pentagon and in that field outside of Pittsburgh. And I gather they're being, they actually can't even go into the World Trade Center yet to collect evidence. Right. I mean, they obviously have a, a ways to go here. It's not yet a, uh, a real crime scene in the sense of forensic specialists pouring over the rubble. They're still trying to rescue people. All right, Evan, thanks very much. Now more on the state of recovery at the Pentagon and to Gwen Ifill. For that assessment, we're joined by George Wilson, military columnist for the National Journal and former Pentagon reporter for the Washington Post. George, have you been over to the Pentagon in the last day and seen what it's like there? Yes, I was there uh, this morning and uh, it was still smoking. And the, uh, 
the scene was very somber, very sad. There was a lone American flag flying on the roof where the west side of the building had been uh, devastated by that airliner. The whole face was charred and a big gap was in the building and there were cranes there ready to put uh, engineers on the roof so they could assess where the damage uh, occurred and what the structural problems were. And there were uh, tents outside in the parking lot to attend to uh, the stricken and also to give some meals to the construction workers. You, m you mentioned that it's still smoking. The, our offices are not so very far from the Pentagon and we can step outside and still smell the smoke. Why are the fires still burning if that's what's happening? Well, as of uh, late this morning it was smoking and uh, one of the policemen who said you can't go in there now because the fires have just restarted. It's kind of a honeycomb structure and it has various uh, cells all along these corridors so I suspect that there's little scattered fires that you just can't attack as one solid mass. But I have to add that uh, late this afternoon when I went by, there was no more smoke coming out, and the fire was indeed finally out. So when you talk about the honeycomb structure, when we think about the Pentagon, we know it's five-sided, but unless you fly over it, like a lot right. of people do landing in Washington, there are five hallways, corridors that go right. around in kind of a... Uh, right, there's concentric corridors, just figure like uh, a, a set of uh, donuts, each one smaller than the one behind it. and so. A fireman would have to uh, weave his way through these quarters into these various uh, separated hallways. And it would be a slow moving process. And besides that, a good many of the doors in the Pentagon have combination locks on them. So a fireman couldn't just bang open the door and go in there with a foam or, or hose. He'd have to either knock down the door or know the combination. And I suspect there was a lot of fire axes, fire axes at work. So where did this plane actually impact? It impacted in the west face of the Pentagon, which is uh, where the helicopters that take the generals and uh, executives of the Pentagon in and out. And it uh, hit at the lower levels so that uh, all five stories were smashed. And of course, the big damage was done by the fuel. It was, in effect, a very effective bomb. And uh, it hit uh, smack into the face, and it took some pretty good flying to be that precise. Who works in that area of the Pentagon? It's mostly Army people. Uh, that's an Army side of the Pentagon. But the good news is that because much of that face of the building was under renovation, some of it had already been renovated. And it had uh, glass with, which was plasticized so that it didn't shatter and scatter and, and hurt people. And also, because there was renovations ongoing, uh, several of the offices were unoccupied. So the casualties were less than they would have been if they'd hit, say, another face of the building. Was there any sign of the plane that hit the building left in the wreckage that you could see? I could not see it, which amazed me, because I thought that big a plane, I could spot some uh, pieces of the wreckage. But I suspect it's buried in the rubble or from that distance that they let you uh, go to, which is on the perimeter. Maybe it wasn't visible, but uh, it, it was surprising that there was a hole there as opposed to uh, a splattering of parts on the, mm -hmm. the concrete face of the building. And we can only assume that, that the Pentagon still remains ground zero for whatever retaliatory response the U.S. is planning. You've been doing some reporting on that. What have you heard? Well, that it's not going to be just a single strike, that this is going to be a long war, and they're using the term war, if you notice, more and more, and it's kind of uh, the who, what, when, and where, and as soon as that is determined, uh, there, there will be strikes and eventually, given the president's words and the military planner's words, if you're harboring a terrorist, a known terrorist, and you will not give him up to us, uh, there is certainly a lot of sentiment for inflicting some uh, real hurt on that country. The folks you've talked to who work at the Pentagon, have they gotten over the shock of this? No. It's a very, people go back and forth to work, but it's a very sober kind of movement. It's uh, almost like uh, they're a little bit shell-shocked, and understandably so. With, uh, you know, one, one Air Force officer told me this morning that he was on the entire other side of the building, but the impact was such that it shook the whole building, and he couldn't believe a structure that solid and that built like a fortress could be shaken by such an attack. Thank you, George Wilson. You're welcome. Still to come on the news hour tonight, airport security and how to respond.
The airport security issues late this afternoon. Transportation Secretary 